Continuing in this message series today entitled Disciplines of Disciples, this is part number 26. We've been in it obviously for uh, several weeks now and looking at what it means for us as believers, also known as disciples, to be people that are disciplined. Discipline is not usually a word that we love to talk about. No one likes to be disciplined in the area of maybe eating or exercise or, or controlling your attitude and your behavior. Like discipline is not one of those things that we wake up every morning and go, yes, give me more. That's what I want. I want to be more disciplined. Um, but as believers, disciplined living is because of what Jesus has done. It's, it's actually the, the mercy and the kindness of God and, and his acceptance of us that should drive us every day, increasingly day after day, to say, I want to give God everything that I have. And so no matter what it is, because of his faithfulness, I want to be faithful to him. Oftentimes we get that script backwards. It's what do I need to do or say or avoid in order to gain the favor and the acceptance of Christ. And that is just not the story. He gave a gift to us that we don't deserve and we cannot earn. And because of that, we get to live out a life that says, I'm not going to live like the rest of the world. I'm not going to do whatever my, my mind and my soul, my will and emotions, whatever my flesh wants to do, whatever temptation comes my way. Jesus, you deserve all of that, all that I am and all that I have. And so this is why we've been going through this, talking about things like disciplines such as uh, fasting and prayer and fellowship. And lately we've been talking about generosity. Christians should be the most generous people on the face of the earth. There's usually th three simple breakdowns within generosity. Generosity of your time, your talent, and your treasure. We spent time on time and treasure. And I wanted to so bad. I had it all planned out. It was going to be a slam dunk message on starting off with generosity of treasure, the third category. And when I sat down to write it, I knew right away that we weren't done with generosity of our talent. When I say talent, I'm, I'm not just talking about um, skills, though that's a part of it. It's, it's all that God has given to us, has blessed us with, and that's a wide range of things, in order to be used for his glory and to bring people into relationship with him. So it can be a spiritual gifting. It can, it can be a, uh, something that you're really good at, you're skilled at, that you, you know, have uh, talent and calling in. It might be an anointing to do something that no one else is able to do. There, there's just all these gifts that God has deposited on the inside of us, and we differ from one person to another as far as how many gifts and what kind of gifts, and we don't all start at the same place. We don't all end at the same place, and yet all of us uh, have been called and commissioned by God to do wonderful things for his name. In fact, before you were ever born, before you were ever conceived, long before even creation was made, we are told that God knew you. He had plans for you. He dreams over you. And he has a hope and a purpose and a calling over your life. Some of you, you know that. Some of you, you struggle to believe that that could be true because of the things that you have done or have been done to you. And you're like, I just, that sounds good. It sounds like what I would want to hear, but it just doesn't seem real. I'm stuck doing the job I don't want to do. I'm around people I don't like. I feel like I, would have, I should have been so much further in life by this time, but I just haven't seemed to be able to hit the mark. And so when I sat down to write the generosity of treasure, God's like, no, there's actually more that needs to be talked about with talent. And so I was like, all right, that's fine. I'll, let me just kind of marinate on that. Let me just sit on that. I got some other things to do. So I came back to it later in the week. And I, and I had this plan of I was going to teach a message on how you can discover what you're called to. Because there's a lot of us like me that really feel like I have a pretty clear understanding, though it's still being revealed over time. But I know there's a lot of people that have no clue 
what you're called to, what, what your specific purpose in this life is. And so I was like, okay, let's, let's, let's share how you can discover that. And, you know, what is that? Is that a personality profile test? What are the, the five things that you need to do in order to discover your ultimate purpose here on this earth? And I was really excited to dive into it, and yet I stared at a blank screen uh, for quite a while, frustrated, which doesn't normally happen. And I'm just looking at it, and I just can't seem to write anything down. And the Lord just began to challenge me. Look at some of the big moments where I called people in the Bible and look and see what they were doing. What was going on in that time? So again, I, was, I wanted to move on, but I really feel like there's just a little bit more about this generosity of talent that the Lord has for all of us. But first, let's dive into Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 34. This is after God said that he cares more about you than he does about the birds of the air and the lilies and the flowers of the field and the grass of the field. And so he's saying like, listen, I take care of all creation. I take care of every animal. Of course I'm going to take care of you because you are worth so much more to me. Beginning in verse 31, it says, therefore do not be anxious. That's easier said than done, especially in the world that we live in. All you got to do is get that news report, get that bad report from a professional, from a doctor or a mechanic or something like that. Like it just takes one thing to throw us off course. It takes that one check that didn't go through. It takes that extra expense that hit your bank account, that one relationship that fell apart. All it takes is turn the news on for three seconds to immediately be gripped with anxiety and fear and frustration. And yet God says, therefore, do not be anxious. Again, so much easier said than done. What are some of the things that we're anxious about? It says here saying that what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? In other words, the basics of life. How am I going to survive in this economy? How am I going to build a life for me and my family? You know, I've been seeing all over the news that like, hey, good for us older generations because we had starter homes and we had these opportunities ever for us, but this younger generation, they're just in trouble. They, there's no way in the world they're going to be able to have a slice of the American dream and the American pie on that. And so all this anxiety and fear builds up on the inside of us. What do we eat? What do we drink? What do we wear? Verse 32, for the Gentiles seek after these things. Gentiles in this context are people who do not have a relationship and a covenant with God. And so for us, God's saying that people who don't have a relationship with me, that's what they worry about. That's what consumes their life. Why are you a believer also being consumed by those things? Why have you allowed your joy to be robbed from you because of the demands and the unknowns of tomorrow? It continues on. And your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. What, are the, what things? What do we eat? What do we drink? What do we wear? The things that we worry about, they'll be added to us if we seek God's kingdom first. Verse 34, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can say a big amen to that. I have enough issues today to deal with, enough tasks that I have to check out the box, enough people that are pulling on me for different things for today, I don't even have, really, I shouldn't have any time or space to be worrying about tomorrow. And yet how much of our lives, of our thoughts, of our prayers, of all of that is consumed by not today, what God is calling us today, but for what may or may not happen tomorrow. I know that I spend much of my life not living right now in the moment with God. I live it trying to figure out tomorrow, the next month, the next year. So much of my time is given to that. Now, I'm not saying just kind of bob and weave through life, like whatever's going to happen is going to happen, man. Like, I'm not saying that. Like, there, the Bible does talk about the things like we need to plan and can count the cost, and we should leave an inheritance for our children. Like, there's all these things that a good, disciplined believer should do in order to make sure that, uh, you know, we're not just bouncing through life, but we're living with intention. But if we go back to the scripture, before it, the verse of four, verse 30 says, you of little faith, in other words, those of you that are so consumed with anxiety and stress about tomorrow, you of little faith, it's, it's a wake-up call. It's a reminder that this is also and primarily a faith conversation. 
Faith says, I don't see it. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. And yet I'm still going to trust in God. And we have all the reasons not to. We have all the things laid out in front of us. We, again, we have the, 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 the checking account or the online balance sitting there right in front of us. We have the letter of the person that's rejected us sitting right there in our email on our social platform. We, we have all of these things, these mountains in front of us. It'd be very easy to say, Jesus, I appreciate what you just wrote to not be anxious, what ye just communicated, but you don't understand what I have on my plate, what's going on in my life. And I think God actually wrote this because the natural human tendency or bent is for us to become consumed with anxiety and stress, which is why God continually in his scripture has to remind us to cast our cares upon him, to trust him, to seek him first, because he knows that our faith oftentimes is little and it is struggling. It's easy to believe what you see in front of you. It takes great faith to believe that no matter what you see in front of you, God is still with you and for you and working on your behalf because he loves you and you are called according to his purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 tells us that we need to capture our thoughts and bring them under submission to Jesus Christ. And so every thought, especially and even the ones that bring us anxiety about, I'm not sure how this is going to work. It's going to all fall apart. And my marriage is done. And I'm, I'm going to end up with nothing. I'm, gonna be a, I'm just going to be homeless on the street. My life is in ruins. Every thought that does not line up with God, the, the, the truth of God saying, you are more valuable to me than the birds in the air and the lilies and the grass of the field. Anything that doesn't line up with that, we need to capture those thoughts and submit them once again to the lordship of Christ that says, I am not going to dwell on these. I am going to focus my life and my heart on the Lord. Notice I did not say ignore the issues. I did not say pretend like they don't exist. They are, if they matter to you, then they matter to God. If they're real in your life, then God knows that. He's not saying just bounce through life pretending like nothing is heavy on your heart. But what does he tell us to do? He tells us to have faith, to surrender those to the Lord, to go to him in prayer and seek him in in fasting. And in all those things to say, God, I need you. Without you, I, I I am completely destroyed without you. But with you, I have everything I need. God never calls us to pretend like something's not going on. That's not faith. That's putting your head in the sand. But in the midst of the brokenness, of the fear, of the lack, of all those things, in the middle of that, God is saying, will you still look to me? Will you still trust me? Will you still capture your thoughts and give them to me so that I can heal them? That's what God's calling us to. I would encourage you, do not rob today of the blessing of you for an unpromised tomorrow. Let me say that again. You are a blessing. God has given you to this world to be a blessing. You're blessed so that you can minister the goodness of God to those that are around you. You may not feel that. You may feel that you're the exact opposite of blessing and maybe your attitude doesn't show that at all and your actions don't line up. That's a whole nother story. Let's make sure that our lives are 100% submitted to God so that we can actually live out that blessing to other people. But at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day, both of them and all the way through, you have been placed here on this earth to have an impact to the people that are around you so that when they encounter you, they encounter Christ. And when they ask and they see your good works and they ask, why do you do what you do? How come you act the way that you act when no one else does? You will be able to say, because of Jesus. And so you are a blessing. So I will say it again. Do not rob today, the people of today, the moments of today, the needs of today. Do not rob today of the blessing of you for an unpromised tomorrow. The reality is none of us are promised tomorrow. None of us are promised our next breath. We act like we have 20, 30, 40 years, depending on how old you are. We act like we're invincible. Like it's, like it's granted, it's guaranteed. It's not. We live every moment with Christ, with gratitude in our hearts, saying, today in this moment, I woke up new. If you're alive right now, you woke up in the mercy and the grace of God, which is made brand new every single day. And so Jesus, today, what would you have for me? 
I'm not going to allow my today to be robbed of an unpromised tomorrow. I'm here with you, and I will minister according to what you have called me to for today, this moment, and the, the, the needs that are in the life of those that are around me. I'd like to have Colin help me out with something. You can just stand right up here in the front. Colin, I'd like you to, um, we did this last service, and so I'm going to have you run around and give some high fives to people, okay? And, and these, these high fives, um, imagine them as like um, things that we would search after, right? So some of them are, are you know, the, what do we wear, what do we eat, all that kind of stuff. Like they're the things that we run after, like the scripture's talking about. But there's other things too. And when, the reason why I bring all this up, it sounds like it's an anti-anxiety message, but really it's not. It's, it, it does connect to our gifting, our calling, our purpose, because sometimes the things that we run after is not food, clothing, and shelter. Sometimes what we run after is, God, what's next for me? What's my next ministry? What's the next thing that you want for me? So as you run around high-fiving people, these are just all the things that we allow our lives to be consumed with. And so um, I'm just going to, and be nice, don't hurt anybody. Last time he went through and just, ah, just, just he's got big, long arms too, so he got some momentum on it. So uh, I'm just going to point out a few people, have you just raise your hand, keep it raised until uh, he starts running through and just going to do some high fives right here. So go ahead and raise your hand. Oh, raise your hand right over there. Okay. And uh, let's see, oh, middle, on the outside, just go ahead and raise your hand. Red shirt, right, right there you go, Barrett. Um, actually, this is going to take too long. Everybody raise their hand that wants a high five and keep it up. Come on, I know everybody in here wants a high five. Everybody in here wants a high five. Everybody, okay, there you go. All right, go ahead and run out to the cares of the world. Go. Nicely, be Gentle. Gentle. There's a lot of people you're missing. <laughs> Keep your hand raised. Be clear. They're in the sound booth too. Don't forget them. They're good people. Be gentle. You're coming in hot, man. <laughs> oh, you missed Tammy. He's coming back for you, Tammy. Last time you barely broke a sweat. This is good. Keep it up. Keep it up. Hey. You missed one behind you. What are you doing? <laughs> he's losing steam. I can see it. He's starting to glisten. He's not quite sweating yet. He's glistening. Keep it going. That was weak, but it's all right. <laughs> you got it. You're still missing people. Sequential order, sequential order. <laughs> Almost done. Come on. There's a few up here we missed. Keep your hand raised. Oh, right over there. <laughs> Tammy, raise your hand. <laughs> He's starting to slow down. I can see it. He's regretting saying yes. <laughs> All right, give it up for Colin. Hold tight. <laughs> That's what it's talking about in the Bible, in the verse that we just read. Don't seek after those things. Don't run around like a crazy person, like a chicken with your head cut off. Let me point this out. In this room, obviously we don't worship symbols. Like, we don't do that. But in this room, symbolically, or at least kind of, you know, what we know as Christianity, uh, we have a beautiful cross back there, right? Let me point something out. In all of the running around that you did, all the things that, I mean, you high-fived almost everybody that was here. In all of that, you're no closer to Jesus, to the cross, than when you started. Slightly out of breath, right? And, and like, like, that was running around. That's a lot of energy that was expelled. Yeah. Not only that, but not only were you running but our poor camera guy, I told him, <laughs> stick with him, like stay with him. So not only did you go on a massive journey, but you dragged him with you, right? That's what it looks like, by the way, when we are living our lives anxious and worried about tomorrow, including what am I called to? What's my gifting? What's my purpose? What's my talent? God, what's the special thing that you put me on this earth to do? When we are running after and searching after those things, that's what we look like in the spiritual realm. We are just ping-ponging back and forth aimlessly, and we're doing things. We're expelling energy. 
but we're not actually making any ground. We're not actually getting anywhere. And we're dragging people with us, loved ones, family, friends, church members. We're dragging them with us as we are just loaded down and, if I will say this, diseased with anxiety. But let's try it a different way. Let's simplify this. I'm going to have you go down just the left-hand side of this middle row. And I only want you to look at the cross. And as you go down, so now everyone on the inside of this row, this right here, right when he gets to you, he's not going to be looking at you. He's only going to be looking at Jesus. His hand's just going to be out. All I want you to do is put your hand up and make sure it hits his hand because he's not breaking eye contact with the cross. It's only this row right here. Let's try it. Camera guy, you ready? Stay up with him. You got this. But wait till he gets to you. Go. Now, I know this is an overly simplified illustration. If only life was that easy. Straight roads, wonderful people with smiles on their faces. High fives all the way around. If only, the, and there's a giant LED cross that was Jesus that you could go towards. Like, wouldn't it be easy if everything was like that? Well, let me point this out. God did not design, equip, call you to be scatterbrained all over the place and to run from one high to the next, from one idol to the next idol. God says, seek first his kingdom. That means to run after Jesus. God, whatever you say in your word, I want to know you personally. I want to, I want to follow after you. Because wouldn't it be sad if we got to the end of our lives and we did all of these things? We were successful. We had every mark. Everyone looked at us and went, wow, they're an amazing Christian. They led several community groups. They pray at the prayer gatherings. They come to church service. They volunteer. They serve. They even know what their purpose and their calling is. They started a ministry. They did something really unique for the kingdom of God that no one's ever done. You do all of these things just running all over the place. And you get to the end of your life, and this is what you hear. Depart from me, for I never knew you. The scripture that talks about that says, hey, listen, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your, day, in your name. We did money, money works in your name. And Jesus said, I didn't know you. That would be the worst sentence you could ever hear in your life. But if you will give your heart to the, I will pursue Christ, his kingdom first, that person, Jesus, will be my pursuit in the right time, in the right space, and in the right way, the things that you need, just like Colin walking down the center aisle, and only when he got close to them did they raise their hand, and his hand was able to hit that mark. If you follow Jesus, that's exactly what takes place. Jesus, it's all about you. I worship you. I follow you. I serve you. I, I bless you. I live my life and surrender to you. And as you do that, he makes the path straight, he brings clarity to every single step. He illuminates it. And everything that you are actually called to do, not all the things that look good, but the things that are uniquely ex for you, those will be revealed according to his timing and according to his provision. Instead of trying to force it, instead of trying to hunt it down, God gives it to you in the proper order. This is why we need to be all about Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then the things that he needs, that we need, and that he wants to give to us, then, right in order, those will be given to us. Some of us, we are exhausted from running all over the place trying to get good things. I'm not even talking about bad things. Good Bible things. We're exhausted from that, and we still feel aimless. We still feel like we have no idea what we're supposed to be doing, and God's just saying, I want your heart. The rest of it we can talk about later. I want your time. I want your attention. And then, and only then, will I reveal to you exactly what you have need of in its proper timing. Again, one more time, let's give it up for Colin. Thanks so much, man. I would suggest using some hand sanitizer after the 
You guys, I mean, you guys are wonderful, beautiful people, but that's a lot of hands to high five. So, <laughs> again, the vast majority of our time should be spent pursuing our relationship with God, not fussing over what our calling and our purpose is. I know some people, that's all they talk about. And they get so frustrated about it or prideful about it. They go like, I know exactly what I'm called to do or they feel the other way. Like, I just feel like God's not telling me and I'm, I, I, I keep asking him and he's not showing me and I don't know why. Listen, I'm telling you right now, there's nothing wrong with asking God. We don't have because we don't ask. So ask God. He loves you. He cares about you. He wants to reveal it to you. But let's not have that be the first and the highest priority. That cannot be the biggest thing in our lives. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, and without faith, there it is again, this faith, believing what we cannot see. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Not seek their calling and purpose, not seek their giftings, not seek their next position or their next platform or their next, you know, opportunity. Those that seek him is are the ones that God rewards. We have to believe that. There's faith that requires that if I run after you, Jesus, you will reward me according to everything that you want. But if I do it my way, I'm going to probably get some of those things. They're just going to either delay or hurt my relationship with you, but they're certainly not going to bring me closer to you. I, I remember two, call, two callings that I've received over my life and, and by the way, I, I do, the reason why I wanted to do this message was especially for those of you who, who feel like you have no idea what you're supposed to be doing. Because my heart honestly goes out for you. I've been in moments, I've been in seasons of like that, but not like many of you have. If I were you, honestly, I would feel hurt. I would feel forgotten and abandoned by God. I would feel like everybody else says things like I had a dream or I have vision or I, have, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I have a purpose. And you're sitting there going, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm just spinning my wheels. I'm just going to work, living my life, eating three meals a day, and that's it. I just don't know. And, I, and the rest of this message is still for you. I just, I want you to know that, that I love you, and God loves you, and uh, you've not been forgotten. Um, there might be some things that might need to be tweaked in your life, and maybe some of the things in this message will be a challenge to you. But for all of us, God is for us. He's with us. And he says that he has plans and hopes for you to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. That's what he says about you. He wouldn't say for some people or for the elite or for the ones that I like or the ones called to full-time ministry. No, we are given promise after promise of God's character. Even in that Jeremiah scripture, like I just mentioned, that was specifically to, Jer to Jeremiah, but God's character is revealed that that's who he is. He develops, he strengthens, he plants, he equips us to do all that he has in store for the kingdom of God, because there's a purpose that he wants to see. It's, more, it's not about what we want, it's about what he wants, but he, for some reason, chooses to partner with us. I'll be honest with you, if I was God, I wouldn't choose to partner with any of you myself included. Like I would just do it all myself. I would, you know, I would just wave, wave the magic wand and just take care of every single thing that I want to take care of. And yet for some reason, in all of his might, his wisdom and his power, God chooses to use broken vessels like us to say, I want to partner with you to do something great here on this earth. He wants people to see our good works so that they can give glory to our Heavenly Father. They ask us, why do you act that way when no one else does? Why are you kind and compassionate? Why do you serve and have generosity in your life? And we have the privilege of being able to say, it's because there is a radical night and day difference in my life because of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you about who he is. That's the blessing that we have. But to my calling, uh, there's two times that I was called that I really feel I had a clear vision and understanding of my calling. This is just my story. I want to share a little bit with you. I've shared it over the years, if you've been here for any length of time. When I was a young kid, right after my brother died, I was in third grade, and I was really hurting. My family was torn up and having a hard time connecting with anybody. I was super shy. And um, the teacher 
started, uh, she wanted to do, it was a part of like the curriculum, she wanted to do like a little fake news broadcast. So they, they went down to the school library and they checked out the uh, VHS camcorder. You guys remember VHS tapes? Any, anybody else? Oh, gosh. Super great technology. And uh, so they brought this camcorder in and they sat it down and they said, all right, so we have all these different responsibilities. Who wants to be the person in front of the camera? And a few kids raise their hands. All right, so who wants to hold the light? Who wants to do the makeup? Like they just went on down all, all these things. And the last role left was the camera operator. And I was the last person left. So that's kind of what I was just, it was handed to me. E immediately fell in love with it. There were so many buttons to push and every one of them did something different. You push that button, the camera shuts off. You push that one, the battery pops out. Like everything did something different. It was awesome. And from that point forward, God just began to deposit more and develop on the inside of me a genuine love for not just technology, but specifically for broadcast video. I remember being a year later in fourth grade, I wasn't a really good artist, but I was drawing stick figures that were like a news broadcast, like how nerdy is this? A news broadcast, stick figures holding a camera with another stick figure holding a microphone. You know, the, there's like the news truck with the satellite dish out in front of it. And, and I just loved, loved, loved this idea that you can be anywhere and beam wirelessly video and anybody can see it. Like it just captivated my, my imagination. At the same time, my mom uh, was hired on at the church that we were at to take over all of the video broadcasts there. So I got to, to play around with all that equipment and learn even more. And, and the story went on. Now you fast forward until I think it was early in high school. And I was running sound in the back, like in a booth like that, running sound for our high school ministry. And the youth pastor forgot his Bible. And so he ran up there and he said, hey, listen, worship was almost done. Listen, I have to go to my office. I forgot my Bible. I'm going to go get it. Handed me the microphone and said, I need you to do the offering message. Okay. You guys, you understand, I'm this nerdy guy in the back, zits all over the face. My voice is still crackling. Like I, I, I'm a sound guy. I'm in a protected little booth. I push buttons and sliders. That's what I do. And he's like, go up in front of all of these high schoolers. And so I got up there. It had not been the worst offering message of all times. I don't even know what I said. I just have to imagine they, they brought in zero dollars that way. I, it was like, people were probably taking money out of the church that day. <laughs> and, uh, but halfway through this train wreck of an offering message, a peace came over me. And it wasn't an audible voice, but it was as close to a voice as I've ever heard. And it was just this is what you'll be doing for the rest of your life. So those two things, from a very young age, is going to be broadcast video and then that, which are completely opposite of each other if you think about it. One of them is behind the camera. One of them is in front of the camera. And so I didn't know what that meant. I just knew I had to be faithful to the one that I, I felt was the clearest. And so I went to Bible school and went to, did an internship at a church, and the rest is kind of history. And now uh, around age 30 or so, I came up here, and we've been here for uh, just shy of 10 years. And uh, and then we had an opportunity a little while into it uh, to start a jail ministry broadcast where we broadcast from the church uh, into the jail. We brought volunteers in there, and we're still doing that to this day. And that was the birth, and that was the beginning. Amen. That was the beginning of the broadcast video here. And I don't know where it was in that timeline, but I just remember one time I was preaching, and I looked out, and I saw a camera there, and I saw a camera here. And I, it hit me in the middle of the message See, I was able to make both happen. You're preaching, and you are still a part, broadcast video is still a part of what I called you to do. Now, there's more that I believe that the Lord is developing on the inside of me, and I'm exploring and, and discovering those things, you know, year after year. It's not just cameras and stages. But I'm just saying this. I didn't understand how those two interacted with each other. It took 20-some-odd years for God to bring some clarity to that, but he was faithful in that. And so I, 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 I value the fact that from a very, very young age, the Lord brought clarity to me. Some of you, you're even older than I am, and you still don't know what you're called to do. I believe there is hope for you in this message, so hold on tight. Remember at the beginning of the message, I said, well, the Lord shared in my heart to look at some of these big biblical heroes, and when they received their calling, what were they doing? And I was like, I don't know, because again, I wanted this message to be something totally different. And so I just started researching, and this is what I, I looked at. And just here's a short list, it by no means covers all of them. 
And you may not know any of these people, especially if you're not familiar with the Bible. It's okay. Just listen to the journey that this, that this takes us on. Nehemiah was a Jew that was in exile. And he had a, very dis, dis, uh, a job that was, uh, made him very dispensable. Like, like uh, it, he was a cupbearer, which meant if someone tried to poison the king, he would be the first one to die. So he had to test everything to make sure that it wasn't poisonous. And the king would look at him, and if he didn't pass over and die right in front of him, he knew the meal was okay to eat. Terrible job. Not a good job at all. I don't want that job. Right? So he goes, and he stands, and he sees the ruins of the walls of, of, the, of his people, of his land, of his city. He sees it, and he sees that they've been broken down. They've been burned and destroyed. And he looks at that, Jerusalem, and, he's, and he says, this isn't right. And he begins to petition that king, which was evil, begins to petition that king for resources and for time so that he can go back and he can build the walls once again. Great, amazing story of leadership, of faithfulness, of God's provision, and found in Nehemiah. But you got to understand, he was a slave serving in the court of a king. Every single day, his life in jeopardy. He wasn't sitting there praying eight hours a day for his vision, for his purpose and his calling, his talent. He was doing simply what he was supposed to be doing, going on in rapid fire. Now, we had Abraham at age 99 and Sarah at age 90 with no kids, God saying, you're going to have kids. I don't know about you. I mean, if you're in that age range, good on you. But that's not the time to be having kids. Like, kids zap every bit of energy out of you. You need to be young to be able to pull that off in some regards. And so in all of that, I would have been like, there's no way we're having any kids. And God's like, no, actually, you're going to have so many. It's going to be like the stars in the sky and the, and the, and the sand on the seashore. That's how many kids and generations you're going to have, and they're going to be called blessed because of you. That's what God did. And so Abraham and Sarah, they were old. The opposite of old would be young. Look at David. David was in the field taking care of his father's sheep, probably one of the worst jobs you can have in the house. Sheep are smelly. They're stupid. They're, you're, you're isolated, and that's what he was taking care of. And so when, when the prophet came to anoint the next king of Israel— all of David's brothers were lined up. And the prophet went down, no, it's not him. No, it's not him. No, it's not him. Do you realize that David's dad forgot that he even existed? Not only was he young and doing the worst job, but he was completely forgotten. Oh, that, that's right. I got another son, David. I guess I'll go get him. That's how God found David was in the middle of a field at age 15. He was young and he was forgotten. What about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Joseph before they were married and before they had Jesus? They were just living their daily lives. They, they were completely living in obscurity. Their dream came to them in their sleep. It's not like they were anything special, but God came and said, listen, you're going to bring forth one of the, through you is going to be one of the biggest miracles of all time. They were in obscurity. What about Moses? He was running from the law because he killed somebody. He was hiding from his family because of the disgrace that he brought on them. And then when God said, hey, I need you to go back and you're going to be the person I'm going to use to take the Israelites and bring them out of slavery into freedom. Moses is like, no, 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 no. I can't speak well. I have a stutter. You must be, you need somebody else. Every single way because of his lack of talent or the struggles that he had because of his outlaw background and his broken family, anyone in the world would look at Moses and say that he was disqualified and unqualified. And it's true. And yet God called him. Joshua was faithful as the number two to Moses. He served Moses. He went in as a, as a warrior and did whatever that, that was needed with no promise of being the leader of Israel one day. And yet, because of his faithfulness, God made him the leader of Israel. Gideon was hiding in the wine press terrified, shucking wheat, just doing whatever he can to barely survive because of the wickedness of the, of the people that were in the land at that point. He was full of fear. Noah saved all humanity by the ark, and he did that not because he knew what a boat was and because he kept asking God, I want to do something big. I want to do something so big that thousands of years from now, they make a Veggie Tales show out of it, and they make a felt board out of it, and you, can buy, you can go and visit the Ark Encounter. That's what I want to do, God. What's my purpose? Give me something big, sassy, and juicy. I want to go. 
I wasn't doing that. He was living holy in a sinful world. That's all he was doing. He was raising his sons to be godly men in a perverse generation. That's all that Noah was doing. And God found him and said, listen, you are going to be used to save all of humanity. Saul was riding his horse before he became Paul. Saul was a persecutor of Christians. He was a Jew that was incredibly passionate. He was on the road to go murder many Christians, and God got a hold of him in an instant, knocked him off his horse, blinded him, and brought him to a place of humility before he used Paul to write almost two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul was incredibly passionate. I mean, you got to give it to the guy. He didn't just kill one or two Christians. He killed a lot of Christians. He was very passionate about what he did. But when God got a hold of his heart, he became one of the most passionate Christians of all time. And so he was passionate. What about Rahab, the prostitute? She helped the Israelites win back the city. And so Rahab full of sin, living a lifestyle that absolutely did not honor the Lord, and yet it was accounted to her righteousness and her and her family. God found her right in the middle of her sin and said, you know what? You're the one I need in order to get the leaders and the military individuals into the walls so that they can take the city. God, she found herself smack dab in the crosshairs of God's purpose, even though she wasn't this godly, holy person. Queen Esther, almost done. Queen Esther was married to a murderous psychopath, the king. And this king wanted to kill her people. He didn't know that it was her people. He just wanted to wipe out all Jews. She didn't tell him that she was a Jew. And yet in the midst of it, she recognizes that she's probably the only one the king would maybe listen to so that her people could survive. Esther was just trapped in a bad marriage. By the way, you think you have a bad marriage, and I'm not making light of bad marriages, like let's get help, let's pray over that, let's get some counseling, but I don't know if anybody in here is married to a murderous psychopath who tries to kill their family. Maybe you are. Again, we're, you know, Monday through Thursday, we have office hours, you can come in, we can meet, you know, we can talk about your murderous spouse, but, uh, you know, again, sometimes perspective is helpful, you know, but I say all that to say this. Back to that list again. Whether you're a slave, you're old, you're young, you're forgotten, you live in obscurity, you're unqualified, you're faithful, you're fearful, you're holy, you're passionate, you're sinful, you're trapped. It, God found all of these people not when they were desperately pleading to him to show them their calling and their purpose. They were living their lives. They were going through the normality of life and God found them. Now, again, I'm not saying don't ask. Ask the Lord, is there something I can be doing that I should be putting my life, my energy, my, my every, every bit of resource that I have that I should be investing in and walking towards? I believe it's good to ask. But some of you, you, are, you have held captive your walk with the Lord until you figure out what's next. I'm not going to serve at the church. I'm not going to spend time praying with God. I'm not going to do all these things until I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing because I don't want to waste any time. I don't want to waste any effort. You know what maybe the reality for, for you and for all of us is? Is we have to be found faithful in the little things, the mundane things, the day-to-day life kind of things in order for God to trust us with bigger things. If you're not faithful in the little, you'll not be given charge over much. But if you are faithful in those little things, God can trust you with more. And so every single one of these people... God found them, commissioned and called them to something of greatness, which is why we read about them thousands of years later. All I'm saying is, is I have heard too many people that do nothing while waiting for, their, for, while waiting for clarity. And that is not what God wants us to do. Live your life in passionate pursuit of Jesus. And along the way, the high fives will be revealed. The calling, the purpose, the gifting, what you are to put your life and all that you have towards, those will be revealed to you if you pursue Jesus. Do not be full of anxiety, running from thing to thing to thing. What's my next church and my next position and my next title and my next opportunity and my next audience? And what's my next blog and my next website, my next this or that? Don't be consumed by those things. Be consumed by Jesus, and he will bring those things in alignment and order for you. Amen. 
I have up here a backpack, a clear one. has a lot of things in it. I have, I can see here, two iPhone boxes. There's an iWatch case right here. Um, and oh, oh, another iPhone right there. We got a nice DSLR camera up here, a bunch of cash, some mediocre coffee from Starbucks. And, uh, and uh, just to clarify, I don't like Starbucks coffee. Someone's like, oh, you love Starbucks. No, I don't. It's all burnt. But uh, it just, you know, <laughs> anyway, it's there. Um, a nice watch. Uh, glasses, there's a giant iPad Pro behind here, there's a wallet over here, um, and all that kind of stuff. So obviously a lot of value in this backpack right here. Can, now, if you're from this town, uh, I'm not trying to rag on you, I'm not trying to give you a hard time, so just forgive me in advance. Uh, all we know is what the news tells us, okay? So, um, but can you imagine if I put this backpack on? and drove to like, mm, I don't know, randomly, the southwest part of Chicago, or the south part of Chicago, and just walked around the streets, right? Just walking around with a clear backpack with all of these valuables, and oh yeah, at the bottom there's a drone down there. Can you imagine that this, uh, let me ask you this, I mean, for real, how many of you and you, you could take your own backpack filled up with any kind of valuable that you want. Maybe you don't care about I watch anything. You have your own valuables, antiques, whatever it might be. Would you actually take a clear backpack and go to, let's say, some of the roughest cities in the United States and walk around downtown, let's say, at nighttime? Raise your hand if you actually would do that. Oh, there's some of you, you're always looking for a fight. I'm surprised you haven't raised your hands. <laughs> but most, because there's common sense. Most of us are like, I do not unnecessarily need to add an opportunity for, to get mugged and for something of value of mine to be stolen from me, correct? Like common sense would, would share that. The reason why I share this is because there is this story. I'm not, I don't have time to read the entire thing. It's found in Genesis chapter 37 through 47, so several chapters. And this is a story of Joseph. Joseph has this dream that he shares with his family members, with his brothers and with his dad. And, and I have no idea the attitude of Joseph's heart or the approach that he took. I don't know if this was just a very, you know, I'm excited to share something with my loved ones, kind of uh, childlike approach, or if it was, look at my dream, look at what God wants me to do, I am so much better than you. I don't know what his approach was. All I know was it didn't turn out well for him. Basically, his dream was this, in a nutshell, is, uh, you know, in a variety of different ways, his dream was that one day his brothers, his family would be bowing down before him, right? And, and so, so they heard that, and then put yourself in their shoes. You're, you're the sibling of somebody, and they say, one day I had a dream. God gave me this dream that one day you would bow, that I would have to bow down before you. Doesn't really sit well, does it? It's not really the greatest thing to hear. And they obviously didn't receive that well. No, most of us wouldn't. They were very offended by it. They, they felt like, man, that's really prideful. Like, how dare you say that? You, you already got our dad's favorite child, and now you got to throw this in our face? And so they respond incredibly appropriately. They beat him senseless. They throw him in a pit to, to die, leave him there, and then eventually pull him out of the pit and sell him into slavery. Uh, I know some of you, again, have just bad brothers and sisters. I don't think any of you have ever been beaten, thrown in a pit, and sold into slavery by your brothers or sisters. That, that, that's just, I can't imagine how betrayed I would feel if I was him. I can't imagine how hurt I would be that all I did was share my dream with you, and you so rejected me with violence and vitriol that you sold me into slavery. Basically saying, I, like, I don't want you in my life. That's what they did. Now, the story is amazing. If you actually read through it, I mean, one definitely worth going home and reading. The story is great. He goes on, and he goes from a moment of slavery, eventually into being in prison, so it doesn't sound good, but all the way through, he maintained his character. He, remains, he, he remained full of integrity, even when he was tempted sexually, uh, and like he served other people, even though they were evil. He interpreted dreams of people that put him in prison. I mean, it was just, there were things that he did because he was a man of God that most of us probably wouldn't do. We would have given up 
We would have hated God. We would have given up on our calling and purpose. We would have hated our family. He didn't do any of that. He remained faithful. You should totally read the story. Eventually, through a crazy set of circumstances, he becomes the number two, effectively, in Egypt and put in charge of all of the finances and put in charge of all the goings on that happened in Egypt to the point where they had many years of prosperity. He used his wisdom that God gave him to store up all of those resources during the years of prosperity because there were years of famine that followed. And all of the nations and the people around Egypt came there begging for assistance. And that's actually the fulfillment of the dream. His brothers, not knowing that the one that they beat up, they jumped, they tried to kill and then sold into slavery, not knowing that he was still alive and he was that guy, they went and they bowed down before him, begging him for resources during the drought. And eventually, I mean, he toyed with them a little bit, but eventually he revealed who he was. And there was this difficult yet beautiful moment that took place. His family was blessed because of it. He was blessed because of it. And God did a miracle. By the way, that took 22 years. Some of you have been waiting for six months and you're frustrated. Or you've been waiting for a few years. You're like, God, where are you? You've obviously abandoned me. 22 years imprisonment, pits, slavery, falsely accused, left to rot in a jail. And all of this, God was faithful to him. I say that with this backpack because there's a story that I wanted to share. Again, many of you in here, you don't know what you're called to. But for those of you that do, I have a story of caution for you. Just hear me on this. When I was, the first year that I was here, I had our leadership team. And I was so excited. There were so many great things that I wanted to do and see and be a part of. And I remember sharing a, a, a dream, a, a vision that I had for what the church was going to do. And I shared it with one of our leaders, someone I really liked talking to. She was a really nice person. And it was just, it was a good moment. We shared that moment. And I really hadn't shared it with anybody else other than my wife. And I just, I was super excited about something that I wanted to see the church do, that, that I wanted for us to accomplish. I'll never forget, it was a few, I don't know if it was like a few days or a few weeks later, that dream that I had got out. And found out that that person shared it as in, they didn't say, hey, this is what Pastor Jerry wants to do. This, is, this person said, this was what I wanted. Pastor Jerry didn't want it, but I convinced him that this is what we should do. So this is what we're doing. Now, in the grand scheme of things, again, I wasn't beaten, left for dead, and sold into slavery. You know, first world issues, boo-hoo, the vision got out a little bit early. But I can tell you in the moment, my heart was ripped out. I felt like a dagger went through me. Because vision... Purpose calling is so precious. It's valuable. When God gives it to you, it's something that you should hold on to, that you should be thankful for, that you should protect, that you should nurture, that you should grow. And I gave that too soon to someone I should not have given it to, and they took it and they abused me with it. And they pulled the rug out from underneath me on that. Joseph had to learn that. I had to learn that. Sometimes you can share vision too soon and with the wrong people. That's why we need to pray for discernment and for wisdom. If you do have something, you can't treat it like everybody needs to have access to it at all times because, again, it's valuable. And there are people out there, Christians and non-Christians alike, that will see what God has deposited on the inside of your life, and they will see it and will go, I'm going to take advantage of that person. I'm going to use them. I'm going to abuse them. And they might not even think in those negative terms. They might just go, I want what that person has. Ooh, they can help me get to my max level. They can build my my ministry. They can do, they can, they're the missing key to my life and they'll take what has been given to you that's precious and they will take it away from you and they will use it in the wrong kind of ways. It's not everybody. That's not everybody's story, but I'm just letting you know right now, there is a lot of maturity that's needed for you to say, God, thank you for giving this to me. And just like Mary did, when she was told about her being the one that was going to give birth to Jesus, the word tells us that she treasured those things and pondered them. She thought about them. She prayed about them. She processed it. She didn't run around and tell everybody. She held it close to her and with her husband. And that's what we are oftentimes ready to, called to do. Because I'm telling you right now, when that vision got out, our church wasn't ready for it. Now, since then, we've accomplished it and then some. 
But our church wasn't ready for it. So I had to clean things up. I had to walk some things back. I had to re-explain it. I had to bring correction to it. She took what was beautiful and she torpedoed, not just me, but the church with it. And I'm just telling you, not everybody has the best of intentions for you, even if they think they do. There is wisdom, and not hiding it for the rest of your life, but it's so much better to to wait to hear the voice of God say, all right, right now that gift that I gave you, that I deposited in you five, six, ten years ago, there's someone right now that needs that. Give that to them. Let that be, I put it in you years ago. I've developed you. Your character has been refined. And now you're actually able to give this and let it be a blessing. And obviously I'm using physical electronics as an example of something that's precious. But so much more is the gift, the calling, the purpose that God has for you. It is beautiful. It's valuable. Some of you, you're just, you're like me, loose lips, sink ships. You tell everybody because you're excited. Sometimes we need to keep our mouth shut and we need to let God develop and correct us and change us so that when we give that to other people, it actually is a blessing to us and to them and everyone that receives it. Romans 11, verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Other translations for irrevocable say under, are under full warranty are not regretted, are never canceled, never rescinded, and never withdrawn. I am so thankful that God, what he has given to us, says even in all the bad things that we do, he will not pull that away from us. That sounds good, but some people have taken that a step too far to go, I can do and say and think whatever I want, and no matter what, I'm going to accomplish the, the goal and the thing that God wants me to accomplish. It's not true. Some of you have been fed that lie that you would hear something that sounds positive like you've not missed it, you've not lost it, you've not gone too far, you've not done too much, you've not messed it all up. The reality is we can mess this thing up. We can miss the mark. Now I'm thankful that we have a greater reality which says no matter how much we destroy the things that are in our hands, God can take what is ashes and make something beautiful out of them. God can take even what we or the enemy meant for evil and he can turn it around for good. So I'm not saying all hope is lost, but there is always a journey of restoration back. There's a journey of trying to make things right back. And so if you feel like you have missed the mark and and you're maybe in even especially if you're older, you're like, I just I blew past my gift and my calling. There's no way that I can ever be seen or realized again. There might be some ramifications and reality to that. But I also know that my God is a miracle working God and he can do impossible things exceedingly abundantly above all that we ever ask or think because he loves you because you're called according to his purpose. Let me, let me read this out of Esther because this is, a, this is important. Esther 4, verse 14. For if you keep silent, this is a family member warning Esther, warning her, Because again, her husband wants to kill all of the Jews. She's the only one, if she reveals the fact that she's a Jew, the only one that that could possibly change this, at least from her perspective. This is what her family member says. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise up for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is the balance, by the way. Have you gone too far? Have you messed it up? Is your best days behind you? Yes and no. It says right here, if you keep silent at this time, which means you have a choice. You have a choice to pick up what God has laid at your feet for you to pick up or you can ignore it. If you remain silent, Relief and deliverance will rise up for the Jews from another place. God loves people so much that even if you say no, he is going to find a way to minister to that person. That shouldn't be a, oh, cool, I'm off the hook because somebody else will do it. It should be a, wait a minute, God, you're so faithful. I want to be a part of what you're doing. I don't want to be the one that passed it up, that sits in the shadows. I want to be at the forefront of all that you have. He says, listen, if you won't do it, God's going to raise somebody else up to take care of the Jews because he loves them. But here's, it says, but you and your father's house will perish. Or in other words, there's still ramifications. 
But then he reminds her, but who knows whether or not you have been called, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Let me challenge and bless you with this. I know the answer to that. You have been placed here on this earth for this exact time. God did not mess up. You weren't a mistake, regardless of what was told to you. God formed and fashioned you for this very moment. You weren't born 100 years too early or 100 years too late. Every issue in this world, God has and will uniquely equip you to handle. I wish, I'll be honest with you, I wish I lived like 50, 60, 70 years ago. Life just seemed a lot easier back then, a lot less temptation. It would have just been great to be a Christian back then. But God reminds me, no, you have been designed and called to be a pastor in this exact day and hour. Do not relent. Do not give up. I am with you every step of the way. I would remind you of the exact same, same thing. I'll read this again, but you need to hear this for yourself as I end. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will still be raised up for others. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe you are called for this very moment. Let's not make God chase us down. Let's not be like two teenagers trying to flirt with each other, playing hard to get. God saying, come on, come on, let's do this. I have a purpose. Let's, I got something I need you to do. And you're over here like, oh, well, okay, today I'll do it, but not tomorrow. And I want to be a part of you today, God. I want to know all there is to know about you. But now I want to be over here and hang out over here. Oh, you're still, you're still pursuing me? You still want me to be in your presence? Okay, I'll come over and be in your presence. Back and forth and back and forth. If you love me, say yes, cootie catcher. Like, you guys remember those things? <laughs> no. Listen to the voice of the shepherd. Stop playing hard to get. When he calls you, answer with a yes. Let your yes be for him. Let your yes be for those around you that need to hear about Jesus. You are called for this very moment in this very time. Last scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 through 14. This is written, by the way, by the wisest person that ever lived, Solomon. So listen, it's not my words, it's his. The end of the matter. In other words, everything's summed up. I looked at it all. I've seen it from every angle. I forward and backwards. I can tell you the most important thing. The end of the matter. All has been hurt. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment. Every secret thing, whether good or evil. The wisest man in the world knew this whether you know your purpose or not, your specific, unique calling or not, all of us have general revealed responsibility. The word here is the duty of every man. Whether you have clear, vivid direction or you feel like you're wandering aimlessly, give your heart to these two things. Fear God, which means honor God, and keep his commandments. Fear the Lord, keep his commandments. You know what that is? It's seeking first the kingdom of God. It's all for a circle. Seek first the kingdom of God. If you just keep doing that, whether you ever know what you're called to do or not, it doesn't matter. You do that, God has your heart and he has yours. You guys love and care for each other and find each other in the safe, you find yourself in the safest place you could ever be. Lord, I pray for every person that's here right now. Lord, I ask, I don't know where they're at in their journey as far as discovering you, discovering what you've, what you've placed them on this earth for. But Lord, I just ask that you would rest with them right now and they would choose to reside and rest with you. Lord, that their eyes would first and fully and continually be fixed on you. You are the author, the beginner of their faith journey and you are the one that will finish it. And so Lord, would you continue to call them to you. Remind them not to, not to be running all over the place trying to check every box and hit every mark, but to be consumed with passion for you, Jesus. Lord, help us to know who we can reveal these precious gifts to, who and when and how, so that they're actually a blessing. They can be used for good purposes and not misused and abused. 
Lord, help us to not lord over other people when we do have clarity and they don't. But with humble hearts realizing that none of us would be able to do anything if it weren't from you. Apart from you, we are nothing. But in you, we can do all things. Lord, we thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your patience with all those biblical heroes that I mentioned and so many more. Whether our name ever makes it in the history books or not, Jesus, just to be in one moment with you is better than a thousand anywhere else. Better than millions of followers. Better than the biggest platforms and the greatest opportunities in the world. A moment of sucking in your court, in your presence is worth us running from those and running to you. We thank you for this, Lord. Remind us of this over and over and over again this week. In Jesus' name, amen.